Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today in the show, we're joined by Matthew Kimmel, a researcher at CoinShares focused on Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. We're doing a tour of the headlines, talking about Riot and Gmo Internet lawsuit. Also talking about Argo blockchain's delayed procurement of Intel chips and finishing up with a discussion on Antpool and Bitmain's new low interest rate ASIC loan program. Matt, welcome to the Compass Podcast. This is take three, I think, for us. Three separate recordings that have gone awry for technical and other reasons. I think last time we both just had like the worst energy possible, so we decided not to publish it. But I am excited today to have you on the podcast. I'm just um, I'm buzzing go. to be on the pod. <laughs> You've been uh, getting that IV bag in you, getting some energy and some, some energy drinks. I've been eating a lot of coffee to get going. So we should be doing pretty well today. Yeah, I got a. Uh, I'm a yerba mate guy, so oh, I got a fresh tea in me, and I'm there ready. We go. To work. Well, let's do a quick intro on you. We'll keep it brief, uh, just about coin shares and your position there, and then we'll jump right into some mining news for the audience. What we're going to start doing here pretty shortly is mining news recaps on Saturdays. So it'll be like 20, 30 minutes, catch you up on all things mining related news. We'll even slip in some other stuff related to like the technicalities of block space production or anything that Matt is working on over at CoinShare since he produces a lot of great research. So buckle in for that, but Matt, I'll hand it off to you. Yeah, research analyst at CoinShares, keep it brief. CoinShares is a uh, financial institution um, in Europe. We put out exchange traded products. Uh, we do have a capital markets team. Um, we have a venture arm and uh, I do research there. That's great. I love it. Mostly Bitcoin and a lot of mining stuff. We're going to start with, we have three or four topics today. Just a little roadmap for the audience. We're going to start off with this lawsuit between Riot and GMO Internet. GMO Internet is a big Japanese internet firm that has been mining Bitcoin actually since 2017. And they've been hosting with Windstone. Windstone was procured by Riot in 2020 or 2021. If memory serves me right. And so Riot has basically inherited any sort of contract disputes between GMO and Windstone. The thing I think I like to contextualize all these conversations about lawsuits beforehand is one that I'm not a lawyer. So don't look to me for advice. And Matt, I don't think you are either. I think we're both. Yeah, I'll young. second that. <laughs> so take everything we say with uh, large lumps of salt. And second of all, that a lot of these contract disputes are pretty germane to any sort of industry, especially anything involving money. So it's not necessarily anything shocking. We'll throw up this thread from Wolfie Zhao, who is a reporter at the blog and actually a pretty common guest on the Compass podcast. Wolfie has been reporting on Bitcoin mining since 2018. Um, So he's a great source for all things. And now he does research or the block for Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, and really any sort of mining. So this thread, he just kind of details what's going on with Riot, Windstone, and GMO. I can give a brief breakdown. GMO has been contracting with Windstone since 2018, 2019, 2020, somewhere in that range. They are first in Northern Europe, and then they just had to move to Louisiana with Windstone for hosting. Louisiana didn't work out, so they moved to Texas. Obviously, everyone knows about the Rockdale site in Texas. It's been all all over CNBC and YouTube. Uh, But there's been some disputes over the 50 megawatts of hosted capacity that they have at the site. Uh, And that's more or less come down to what it seems from reading between the lines, an issue with uh, the machinery that GMO has and then the cost of electricity. So Riot has really cheap electricity at Windstone. It's like sub three cents. But that doesn't really matter if your machinery is really old. And it looks like GMO has machinery that's like 70 joules per tera ash. So that's compared to an S19 where you're around like 35 plus joules per tera ash around that range. So not very good machinery, which means that you need really low cost of energy to be revenue uh, or have good revenue and have good profit. And there's a dispute over it, especially now. Yeah, like you could probably limp by for a little bit, right? So, of course, there's lawsuits going back and forth. There's a counter lawsuit from Windstone alleging that everything was contractual. Uh, it looks like they're all bringing damages against each other. For me, my, my first take before I hand it off to you, Matt, is like this is 
this is going to happen, especially with hosting, because everyone has these contracts and everyone's trying to squeeze money out of each other. And now that we're into a territory where Bitcoin mining revenue is significantly down, people are going to be griping for money and trying to shore up their books as much as possible. And sometimes the best way of doing that is a lawsuit. Yeah, I mean, I think everything was probably peachy in the bull market, right? Because like price just outpaced hash rates so far. Um, and so mining revenues were super nice and, you know, there's no problems and no one really cares that much about how efficient they are. They're just trying to get as many hashes out as possible. Um, but now in the, in the bear market, um, you know, we're seeing some cash flow problems. Uh, we're seeing minor margins get really thin. And so I'm not surprised to see, um, you know, some disputes going on here and people trying to squeeze out any cent, any dollar they can. Um, I it's sort of an out of the blue story for me, though. I didn't necessarily know about GMO, but they are, a, you know, a longtime public miner that's been out there since 2017. It's an uh, interesting story to see. Um, be cool to see uh, how it turns out. Um, you know, not a lot of precedent in legal disputes in the mining industry. So, yeah, I, I actually want to do like a whole article or thread about these sort of topics, but I think I'd need a little more data before doing that. Probably a whole lot of time to do it correctly, since it is legal stuff. But I do think there is a lot of contractual disputes that are going to become like sort of case law for Bitcoin mining in the future. Uh, obviously, every heavy industry has this sort of stuff, and anything with cash flow is going to have this sort of stuff. Uh, so I'm sure there's other things that like lawyers are going to pull on, but for Bitcoin mining specifically, it's a new asset, new industry. There's going to be a lot of questions about how to do this correctly. Like this CoinDesk article says, this dispute has been going on since 2018, and it's basically around the cost of electricity. Uh, and GMO, if it has really old equipment, then that cost of electricity is going to be a huge pain point for them. So I'm not shocked to, to see something around this topic, like the cost of electricity. I am interested and was a little bit surprised to see something with Riot involved because I feel like they've had such a pristine name over the last two plus years. At the same time, this comes down to hosting, right? So you have to work with so many different bodies. The last corollary here for, that I'd be interested in pulling on is like the hosting side of this conversation. Hosting is something that a lot of businesses do. Compass does this, obviously. But a lot of these larger miners, these publicly listed miners, include hosting as a portion of their business model. And right now, we're seeing from public filings that it's actually not a great business model for them at the moment. I'm sure it was during the bull market, but right now, it's often a loss leader. Core Scientific has a pretty large hosting model as well. And my understanding is, and I don't have these numbers in front of me, unfortunately, uh, which I should, but they are not doing as well as they should. It's more of a loss leader than it is um, something that you can really build an entire business around. You would think that something like hosting would be sort of like an anchor or cornerstone for a business, for a mining business, because you have set contracts and you have set terms and you have an eager buyer there who is locked into a contract for years. But it's often not the case. We see that it's just at the same time you get eaten up on one side of the contract with rising energy prices and you have uh, the hosting party on the other side that might be trying to get out of the contract and then they can use any sort of wiggle room to try to move out of it. So I'm interested, I'm interested to see over the next six months what happens with a lot of these hosting agreements from larger companies like Riot and like Core Scientific. Yeah, just to add to that, I believe, by the way, on the numbers side of things, I'm pretty sure Core Scientific just sold about like 10,000 Bitcoin in the last yeah. quarter. It's just like a they sold 10,000 Bitcoin wow. and they just diluted a lot of their shareholders by filing a new S1. That's uh, right. And their numbers, they're, they're keeping their revenue proje- or their hash rate projections to 30x a hash, but they're trying to raise money. And I think they just went to market to raise more money. Yeah, so. but and to your point, like the the vertically integrated miners, right? Like again, everything was cool in the bull market because any sort of losses that they were having on the hosting side, um, they could make up for it because just prop like mining Bitcoin, prop mining was so uh, lucrative, right? Like they were generating Bitcoin and able to sell it for so much. A lot of them hodled still, but they could still make up for it. And now, right? It's like 
it's still difficult to you know get Bitcoin and uh, it's less lucrative to sell. It's just a troubled market. We're seeing sort of debt restructurings. We're seeing some cash flow problems out there. And everyone's trying to squeeze out that last dime. Next topic I want to jump in on actually is about like Bitcoin mining going mainstream and what that turns into with a bear market approaching. We've had this conversation a lot of times on this podcast and you and I have talked about this in person quite a bit is like the perception of Bitcoin mining. It's obviously decisive or built a wall between two groups with like environmentalists very against Bitcoin mining for a multitude of reasons. And then you have the Bitcoiners out there talking about like what the potential is for Bitcoin and the reasons and justifications for energy pull. Vice just put out this pretty solid video, in my opinion, uh, a video about Bitcoin mining, the effects of it. And there's some very familiar faces in the industry if you are a part of the industry. So we saw Compass is in this actually a few times. Giga Energy plays a huge part in it. Shout out to Matt and Brent. Shout out. Uh, a shout out to, to Houston Mining. There's a few other players in this. Uh, hopefully this plays. So this is a natural gas oil field. And what we have out here is a generator on your left and on the right, one of our manufactured in-house custom data centers. And so we're taking natural gas and converting it into Bitcoin. Let's jump into this video, talk about it a bit. Yeah, I mean, first things first, right? Like oil field miners are actively reducing net greenhouse emissions, right? This is something that it's been talked about it's been explained, but in the general like environmentalist uh, conversation, like it, I think it could still be more of a focal point. Um, like CO two that would be, you know, in the atmosphere um, is actively being reduced by miners. That is a fact, um, and I think it will become more and more prevalent. It's it's one of the more symbiotic business relationships that I think is out there just in general, not just in the Bitcoin space, right? Um, you can diversify your revenue stream sort of as an energy uh, producer. Um, and then as a miner, you get this energy source that's sort of, it's unrivaled, it's away from the grid. Um, and you can turn it into hashes and you can sell it to the Bitcoin network. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, and I mean, I look forward to it becoming more prevalent in the future, especially in Texas, my home state. Yeah, so I, I agree with you. You're not going to get any argument on that front for me. Of course, it's a mining podcast, so you'd be hard pressed to find someone who's going to disagree with you who's going to come on this show. I do think there's a conversation that needs to be had, though, is other people, are they buying this? And to what degree they're buying this? And to what degree does it matter if they're buying this? And I think this video does a good job of sort of balancing it, right? So we have... A journalist goes in there. She doesn't seem like the oil and gas type at all. Kind of fresh boots on the ground. I'm sure Bat and Brent had some fun, took her to barbecue or something like that. They talked about the whole method of being a wildcat or drilling this oil well. The natural gas also comes out with the oil. Tapping that natural gas and using it for Bitcoin mining as opposed to sending down a pipeline or just venting it, flaring it, and whatnot. And the symbiotic relationship becomes very apparent very quickly when you look at the nature of the fossil fuel industry and the fact that you have natural gas, no matter what, if you are using an oil head somewhere. The question though, if you put it on the other side to environmentalists is like, well, should we be having that fossil fuel source in the first place? And are we going to be creating like a new lobby group for the fossil fuel industry through this Bitcoin, these Bitcoin miners who are using these natural gas energy sources to run their businesses, right? And I think it's a fair question uh, when you look at it like the larger scope and want to convince more people about being Bitcoiners. And so like, I'm very convinced about it, but is like the no nominal person convinced about it. And then like a follow-up question, Matt, would be interested to get your opinion on like, how much does it matter really? Because a lot of this stuff is run on private lands and the most that can happen is some sort of state or government agency comes in and shuts it down. We have seen that happen a few times actually here in Colorado. It happened over the summer where an upstream data client was forcibly shut down by a county official who did not like that they were using stranded gas to mine Bitcoin. But besides like these off and on cases here and there, it doesn't seem like it really matters if we're convincing people or not. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think Bitcoin mining, and there's already some evidence of this, will sort of continue to be a state's rights issue. Like you said, there's been some trouble in Colorado. Like we know um, of the sort of bills and the disputes that have happened in New York. 
But, you know, Bitcoin's been very much so embraced in Texas, right? And miners are welcome there and in Wyoming as well. And so I think we'll sort of see case by case where within the United States, at least, um, mining will be more accepted. I think what's challenging about the sort of flare mining um, and just, you know, whether fossil fuels are useful in general, which as an aside, like when you really dig into the topic, I have high conviction that we need fossil fuels very much so, at least in the near term, right? Like we can transition, but you can't just cut fossil fuel cold turkey. Right? It's a very reliable energy source um, that's very useful and important and a lot more things than just keeping our power on, right? Like look look on your table desk or wherever you're listening right now, there's probably plastic, there's probably rubber somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it, it takes like deeper education. It's not something trivial or surface level that you can just understand by reading an article. And I think that's part of the difficulty here um, to really understand like the symbiotic and sort of beauteous relationship that is Bitcoin mining and, and, um, and excess flare gas. You have to understand uh, what is actually happening on an oil well. And that is just different. Right. And that's where it's like, we need to push education. We need to push education, but you know, not everyone's going to have the time to go, you know, research everything. So I think it's just we have to put it on ourselves to, you know, uh, talk to lobbyists and, uh, you know, vote for educated people, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that actually understand this stuff. Um, you know, and hopefully Bitcoin miners will be welcome in a certain amount of states to where it never really becomes a problem. So just a follow up question for you. My, my mind went immediately to public perception of this just as like a media person myself, like the Bitcoin mining industry has put a tremendous amount of effort into education over the last two years. So many content creators were hired by Bitcoin miners. A lot of the little prop shops for education were opened up. Conferences are a huge thing. Uh, there's just a lot of money in Bitcoin mining, or there was last two years, not so much right now. And a lot of money went to education and marketing because of this energy intensive part and this connection with the fossil fuels industry. There's definitely a public image war. And I was frankly pleasantly surprised by this vice piece. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people out there who blast it a little bit and say like, this was not fair. There's some points in it that are wrong. But for the most part, like I was pleasantly surprised. Like vice typically comes at things and is, has an agenda or an angle preset. And I thought they did a very balanced job with it. So that leads me to believe that the education is working like even slightly. Or at least Vice did a good job with this, and the industry is doing a good job of putting people like Matt and Brent forward that are able to talk to bigger publications like this and turn public opinion in a positive way, or at least a neutral fashion. I mean, they had Alex DeVries on this, who's the blog author, a digit economist, central bank employee, not a friend of Bitcoin mining. He was no in problem. it, but he wasn't like, he didn't dominate at all, in my opinion. And like, I thought it was pretty positive, even though the fact that they had a minute. Yeah, I I think you make a great point there to like, um, you know, Brent and just Giga Energy in general, talking to a publication that's not just Bitcoin, right? These conversations can certainly be circular in a lot of ways uh, within the group of people that understand Bitcoin mining and understand Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, taking the voices that are actually doing it um, and putting it in a sort of more mainstream publication that can sort of reach people that don't understand the intricacies and sort of explain it in a really easy way, I think will definitely uh, benefit the public perception like long term, right? Yeah, I think it shows that some of the money was well spent. Okay, let's turn over to the next conversation. We got two left. Argo Blockchain is working with Intel. We have an update on them. And then we also have a nice update about Bitmain partnering with a new firm to offer lower rate interest loans for procuring equipment. So let's share this first one. So the big thing here is not really about Argo, in my opinion. This piece from yesterday shows that they're lowering their expectation for hash rate, but most miners are doing that at this point. To me, the interesting thing in the details here is about Intel's block scale ASIC chip, which has been delayed because Intel is actually actually redesigning them to become more efficient compared to Bitmain's S19XP. And the block scale chip was very efficient 
but didn't have quite the output that the Bitmain chip did. And so you got into this conversation from a manufacturing standpoint is, do the incumbents like Bitmain and MicroBT and others have an advantage over the new guys in the group like Intel? And there's a few others out there when it comes to Bitcoin mining. And so far, we've seen that Bitmain has maintained its edge and they've even come out with a few others uh, machines like the Bitmain S19 Hydro. And I think there's a few other Hydro versions as well. So that's the most interesting thing to me. The fact that they're delaying this as well is interesting given that Grid, Argo, and I think Square were looking at purchasing some of these chips. Yeah, I mean, part of the story here too is like, you know, Intel is a, uh, you know, US public list company, um, you know, building ASICs like on the ground here where uh, the vast majority of the market share of the ASIC manufacturing market is in Asia, right? With what's minor and Bitmain. So it would be interesting to see how, um, you know, deep Intel can carve out a little space there. I know they have deals with, I believe, Grid as well as Argo for this um, for this first round of ASICs. And, you know, they are highly efficient machines. So they're up there with the XP. I think it's uh, like 21 and a half joules per tera hash, if, if my memory recalls correctly, the XP. Uh, but, you know, to your point, you get a lot less hashes in general um, while being highly efficient. So we'll see how the how the miners view that sort of what I've been told is there's different perceptions of what you want, whether it's in a bull market or bear market, depending on where sort of uh, prices and, and difficulty are at. Side note, Marathon um, is moving out of their Harden facility in Montana, I think. Partially for hosting provider issues, but partially for the sort of environmentalist public perception. Um, at least that was my interpretation. And they're uh, selling all of their S19, I believe, J's and upgrading to the more efficient uh, S19 XP's. Um, yeah, interesting. It's time to do that in the deep bear market when ASIC prices are super low. I feel like they're going to take a pretty steep loss on those. That being said, uh, I actually looked it up and the XPs are pretty significantly more efficient than the first model S19Js, even though they're in the same series class. So I don't know. I get, You make an infrastructure push in the bear market, I guess. but Yeah, some of these ASIC purchase orders is going to be something to dwell on going to the next bull market and we'll see the repercussions during this bear market. A bit farms also just disclosed that they sold about 200 S19 XPs and they sold them at a discount, like 50% off. So it took a loss of a million dollars on that sell. And they chose to do it. I think just to get some money back on the books, uh, they sold them for about like $6,000 per machine when they're retail trading for about 11,000. The reason being, I think they just needed money. And we're going to see more teams have to do this because they purchased a six on these huge orders. They're going to have to go back to the drawing books with Bitmain, renegotiate. Bitmain has already been sort of drawing down some of these prices already. And I think they'll be nice just in general because Bitmain's already made its money a few times over. But I think we're going to see some other cases where miners were not ready and are going to get washed out. That's interesting that uh, Marathon is selling all those a six. I did hear about that. I didn't know how many they had sold. It's all about liquidity and cash right now, right? Stronghold just did a debt restructuring as well. More cash flow problems. The, an increasing theme that we'll probably continue to talk about as we do this week in and week out, treasury management among miners. Um, I honestly sort of expected there to be like a bit better uh, strategies uh, this bull market around. I don't know if the expectation was that we were just going to go higher um, and, you know, hit the 100K thresh mark or, or whatever. But I mean, how many of these miners would be in a better position if they sold coins back in November and December, right? Instead of all the coins that they're selling this year, like it, it would make a tremendous difference. So, I mean, it's not just about specialization and operational efficiency anymore. For these large scale miners, risk management, you know, trading and, and hedging out some price risk as much as everyone is bullish and long Bitcoin, right? Will continue to be an important treasury management. You know, I know some of them are diversifying their revenue streams or maybe trying to get yield on their Bitcoin in different ways. 
all this stuff is going to continue to be important. I think we're really going to see it in the next bull run because I think a lot of miners are feeling pain right now in the bear market. No, that was a good rip right there. I like that. I think you're totally right. And it's wild to see that the poor decisions made in November and even earlier, you could have sold all the way up or all the way down, right? And they chose not to do that. A lot of miners sold in May and June, and now they're bearing the consequences for it. We've seen stock dilutions. We've seen Bitcoin sold. We've seen ASIC sold. We've seen facilities go under. We've seen employees be cut. And none of this had to happen if people were more responsible with their treasuries. But the golden bull was expected to go on forever. A lot of Suzu's in Bitcoin mining, but no one's willing to talk about it. Ooh, that's a spicy little soundbite right there, Well, <laughs> A lot of Suzu's in mining. I'm going to have to put that in my back pocket. That's pretty good. It's true. Well, okay. To be fair, what was three rows? Was that like 11 billion assets under management at one point? So not quite that big, but a lot of people were long only and totally bought into that narrative and forgot that they're running a business with employees that need to feed their families. And now we're in a spot where they're laying those people off and people are getting their equity diluted and people are seeing their entire treasury is depleted. It sucks and it didn't have to happen, right? There's a few firms out there that actually did exactly what they're supposed to. They hodled and hedged and did things correctly, built responsibly, didn't have like these huge hash rate projections. And they're checking along just fine, right? They might have to make a few adjustments, but who doesn't have to? Uh, there's just a lot of people bought into this, hold my Bitcoin long only thesis, and now they're getting wrecked. Uh, I want to turn this to subject really quick though unless you have anything else to add there i was gonna say maybe we should talk about whether the sort of shakeout phase of the mining cycle is is over here oh, well, it's not over. We're, we're sort of hash rate i know but a lot of people are calling for it to be over because you know this is i guess there's some metric where you look at like the days since there's been this uh the start of the downward trend in both hash rate and price and we're at that mark but i'm I'm with you. It's like machines are still being um, delivered, right? Like we just had a difficulty increase because I think a lot of the uh, sort of healthy balance sheet miners perhaps, or, or, um, or uh, I should rephrase that. I should say miners that are still receiving machines that have low electricity costs, right? That have sort of healthy uh, operational profit margins. Those miners are still plugging in machines. And so we're still seeing hash rate come online, um, even though like when price dropped, you know, there was a quick reaction and a lot of hash rate came offline from those sort of speculative miners that you know, were in the big city and have like 15 cents per kilowatt hour and just plugged in their apartments. And, they, you know, they are gone. But all these machines that are still being delivered because they ordered from, you know, Bitmain six months ago are still coming in. Um, and I mean, this is also part of the reason why there's cash flow issues, because they're still having to make payments on these things and interest payments, which I guess leads right into this story. Yeah. Wow. Bravo on the segue. There we go. <laughs> Last act there. Okay. Tell me about this. I know Bitmain and this new firm and Alpha are working together on a lending product. This was announced at Mining Disrupt in Miami at the end of July. So it's a bit of an older story, but at the same time, I think we just got new information about the interest rates that they're offering. They're in the high single digits, which is really nice for Bitcoin mining. Typically we see like high teens for any sort of ASIC lending. Yeah. I mean, the, the headline story here, and I maybe that's a poke at, at Coindesk, is that 6.6, .6, I think, interest rate is what they they set on a low bar, which is, you know, a, around half of industry standard. Um, so that's, I mean, that's wild. If you're a new miner looking for financing and financing is really tight right now. I think the reason that this is possible is because Bitmain has sort of offered some proprietary data to this Anta Alpha financing firm. Um, but I mean, new competition in the lending space is just generally interesting, right? There's not that many players that are doing sort of sophisticated lending practices with miners and you know, we know about Galaxy, we know about NYDIG. They're sort of on a lot of the um, creditor lists of these public listed miners. But, you know, to have a new financer that is sort of at, uh, offering very low, rel relatively low interest rates um, is going to be interesting to watch. I mean, that could be a difference for a miner 
um, that has sort of a little bit higher of electricity cost if they're paying less interest expense uh, each time around. So it'll be something yeah. to track for sure. Yeah, no, it's definitely something to watch. Uh, I think these interest rates are going to creep up, especially as debt becomes more expensive. The Federal Reserve is obviously moving things up or got up zero really fast. We're at like 2.5% for the federal funds rate. So that moves everything else upward with it. And it's not only just going to be at, at whatever rate the federal funds rate moves up, right? Federal funds rate might move up you know, 50 bips, whatever. That could turn into a 3% raise for Bitcoin miners or a 5% raise for Bitcoin miners. And very quickly, we get into the 20% interest rate zone. I've seen some rates that are already that high, like 18% plus. Um, so that's those are the rougher ones, right? Those are some of those orders like Argo has outstanding. I think Bit Farms, Green Itch also have a, have a few of those. The nicer ones are around 12%. These ones are really low. I think it might just be because Bitmain probably has a lot of cash on hand. Uh, I'd be interested to get more information about that though. I mean, yeah, it's also like, is that um, a accurate risk assessment? Are these miners actually worth six point like giving six point six percent rates to? Um, or I think the upper bound is like around nine percent. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's very difficult to assess um, you know the creditworthiness and, and risk of a miner because you know while their costs are relatively known, there's so there there's unknown variables in the revenue equation, right? And you, you're just unsure. Um, yeah. Now, sure, Bitmain has a lot of confidence in the hardware that they're putting out, and I'm sure that has a, a part of this equation. Um, but I mean, it it wouldn't shock me if, uh, you know, it hurt them at some point in the future and a miner went bust. It's definitely something to watch with all the debt that's been floating around, all these Bitcoin mining firms that were built on debt, all these purchase orders that were purchased on debt, all these employees that were basically also purchased on debt, have to watch that interest rate and you have to wonder, when does that interest rate go too high, that debt become poisonous for the firm and they start unloading? We've seen a lot of it this summer, but honestly, just like get back to our conversation for five minutes ago, I think we were only seeing the beginning. I think there's gonna be a huge washout, not only with larger firms, like I expect at least one public miner to go bust, but I think there's going to be a roll up for mid sized firm, and a lot of these smaller guys are also going to have issues. I mean, just think about it if you went and took like a small loan out from a credit firm somewhere, like you're a, a small farmer or a small uh, hasher out there with a little farm, got some debt, and then all of a sudden your whole plan went under just because you don't have enough revenue per month to cover your debt. That's a pretty tough place to be. And I think that's going to be the case for a lot of miners out there. Um, I don't want to get too doom and gloom on the podcast, but I, I've just had that gut feeling for quite a while. Well, now you have to throw me a bone. Who's going bust? Who's, who's going bust? Like... I can't do that. I have to get people on this podcast. <laughs> All right. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. Check out, check out Mining Memo newsletter. You can see all of our public mining miner info. What a w. shameless yeah. show. Yes. <laughs> it's good data though. Shout out to Anthony Power. We're going to have him on the podcast again pretty soon here. Talk about... I, jo- I joke, but um, yeah, Anthony's a fantastic analyst. Oh yeah. Uh, you recently put out a thing on um, interest payments of some of the public listed miners. It's very good. It's very good. Yeah. Anthony did a good job with that one. That was Argo, BitFarms, and Greenedge, which all have significant debt holdings. And two weeks later, after we published that, Greenedge went in for restructuring. Argo has now said they're trying to raise again. And BitFarms disclosed that they sold machines in order to raise some cash. So it's important to watch those public filings. It's important to write about them, important for other miners to know about them. Helps you get an edge, because I do think we see dollar per tier ash machines go lower from here. But... Matt, anything else? Any words of wisdom to close out the podcast? Enjoy the weekend, everyone. Take some time. Don't don't only think about mining all the time. Or do. Yeah. That's okay too. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Talk with Sarah. See you next week.